People used to talk about the culture war between the evangelical church and the world. Well, today it seems like we have a culture war, but that war is internal to the evangelical church itself. Different tribes, different groups within evangelicalism seem to be turning on each other. So some folks are accusing people of going woke on race and adopting secular ideologies uh, around race and sexuality. Others are shocked that some Christians are voting for Donald Trump, someone who is a serial philanderer, a braggart, uh, greedy, you name it. What happened that caused these disruptions, these dislocation, and this conflict within the evangelical church? And I trace it back to changes in the nature of the relationship between Christianity and society. How does society view Christianity? A lot of thought has been put into how Christians should see society, but what about the reverse? How does society see Christianity? And so I like to back up to the 1950s. The 1950s was the high watermark of church attendance in the country. About half of all adults attended church on Sunday. Being a Christian, going to church, was just part of being an upstanding member of society. It was the normative thing to do. In fact, it wasn't just church. America still to some extent was a normatively Protestant country. We had the so-called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment the real divisions here was not Christians versus society, but essentially ethnic or sectarian divisions or racial divisions. So you could think about the divisions between Catholics and Protestants and Jews, for example, in that era. But after this 1950s high watermark of church attendance, Christianity started to go into decline in America. It went into decline in terms of church attendance and church membership. and the moral systems of Christianity began to get called into question. So we saw the upheavals of the 1960s. Uh, we saw the collapse of the old Protestant establishment. We saw the sexual revolution of the 1970s. And so starting, I could date it to the Kennedy assassination in 1963, Christianity started going into a period of decline in America. And I divide that period of decline between 1963 and today into three distinct phases or worlds, what I call the positive, the neutral, and the negative world. And these refer to the way that society views Christianity. In the positive world, which I would date from around 1963 to 1994, 64 to 94, think of it that way, uh, Christianity is in decline. I'm not saying all is well for Christianity in America, but Christianity is still basically seen as a social positive. To be known as a good church-going man makes you seem like an upstanding member of society, someone you'd like to hire. And Christian moral norms are still the norms of society. Around 1994, we uh, went through a tipping point in which Christianity was no longer seen as a positive, but became neutrally seen. I call this the neutral world phase between 1994 and 2014. And again, in the neutral world, Christianity is no longer viewed as a positive, but it's not viewed as a negative either. It is essentially one more choice among many that you can have in a pluralistic public square in America. But after around 2014, we transitioned to a second tipping point and entered what I call the negative world in which Christianity is now seen negatively, especially in the elite domains of society. To be known as a church-going Christian doesn't help you on Wall Street or Hollywood, quite the opposite. And Christian moral norms, which still held force in the positive world and held sort of residual force in the neutral world, are now expressly repudiated. And traditional views of things like sexuality are now viewed as a threat to the new moral order. Each of these worlds saw the evangelical church develop characteristic ministry strategies or approaches to relating to, to the culture. So in the positive world, there were really two of these. 
uh, what we call the culture war model today, and you might think of the seeker sensitive model. Both of these are a response to decline. So when I say that the world was positive towards Christianity in this 1964 to 1994 period, I'm not saying again that everything was going well for Christianity. We could see that church attendance was in decline. We could see that the sexual revolution was happening. It just so happened that this had not yet reached an advanced enough stage such that we'd entered a neutral and a negative world. Nevertheless, people sensed that something was going wrong. There was a lot of research done in this era about what is going on with the mainline churches, that they are losing attendance, losing members, for example. And in the evangelical world, two different groups came out of this. One was the culture war group. Again, you could think of that being represented by people like Jerry Falwell in Moral Majority or Pat Robertson with his Christian Broadcasting Network or the Christian Coalition in politics. And these were people who said, we need to fight back. We see the sexual revolution forces, we see secularism, we see abortion on the march, and we need to mobilize to take back the country. And I say this is a positive world movement because they believed that they represented a moral majority, if you will. The very name of the leading institution of the culture war movement speaks to a world in which Christianity could at least plausibly claim to speak for majority. Now, maybe that wasn't true even then, but like Nixon's silent majority, it was at least plausible to claim that. So evangelicals had originally been Democrats, the first evangelical president was Jimmy Carter, elected in 1976. Newsweek called 1976 their year of the evangelical on account of uh, Carter. But as these groups began to get politically mobilized, they ended up aligning with the Republican Party uh, during the 1980s and actually became a very core and important voting bloc in the Republican Party, which they remain to this day. And again, the way that they did business was to fight with the culture. We're going to go to war against the secularists, war against the liberals, take back the country, fight against abortion, etc. That's the culture war movement. The seeker-sensitive movement was a little bit different. It was, in a sense, a prototype of what I'm going to call the cultural engagement model in a little bit. But really with them, what they were saying is, yes, Christianity is in decline, but let's create a more user-friendly version of Christianity to get people in the door. So someone like Bill Hybels, who founded Willow Creek Church in suburban Chicago, he went door to door in suburban Chicago asking people, do you go to church? If they went to church, conversation over. If they didn't go to church, he asked them, well, why don't you go to church? And from this, he designed a very consumer-friendly Christianity uh, designed to appeal to especially these new suburban residents. And this movement, which we can maybe think of today as represented by the suburban non-denominational megachurch and people that operate in that mode, has been highly successful. Thousands and thousands of people came in the doors at some of these churches. And they essentially got rid of denominational distinctives, stodgy old music and liturgies. Things were more informal, uh, more contemporary music, more topical preaching, uh, you know, not so much hellfire and brimstone. Uh, and they really wanted to reach people through essentially a consumer-friendly approach to church. And it was very successful. And these people, by and large, are people you would associate maybe with the religious right, maybe with the sort of center-right conservatives, but they were a little less political than the explicit culture war types. In the neutral world, we saw a very different model of church come. And this is what I call the cultural engagement model. And a lot of people today would not call themselves culture warriors, but a lot of people would call themselves cultural engagers. And this cultural engagement model in part came out of a rising presence of Christianity among upper middle class people, particularly in urban centers like New York, uh, like Washington DC, uh, even like Chicago, uh, as cities came back in the wake of Rudy Giuliani's election uh, as mayor of New York in 1994, which is one reason I date that transition to 1994. Many other things went into that, but the comeback of the cities uh, was an important factor. And these people, they didn't want to fight with the culture. 
they said, we want to engage with the culture. We want to confidently sit down with the secular world in the public square and articulate the gospel to them in ways that speak their language, speak to their longings. And they believed correctly that the gospel actually had important things to say and we didn't have to hide from the culture. We didn't have to fear science. We didn't have to fear the elite media, but we could sit down and confidently engage our truths with them. And this group of people was also more again, positive towards the culture. They didn't just think the world was all going to hell in a handbasket. They thought there were a lot of good things about the finance industry. There are good things about the restaurant industry. There are good things about the law industry. How do we bring Christianity to those and use those professions and domains of society for the flourishing of, of our nation? And so they had a very different relationship, in some respects, the opposite relationship uh, to the culture of some of the culture war people. Nevertheless, many of these people were conservative. Now, some of them were more quietly on the left, but you know they were still people that you would by and large say, these are theologically conservative people at a minimum. For example, they would be anti-abortion, and many of them would say, no, women cannot be in, in the pastorate, uh, for example. That was a ministry model that really came to the fore during the neutral world. Now we enter into the negative world. And what do we see? The culture warriors are still around. They never went away. The seeker sensitives are still around. They never went away. The cultural engagers have continued on into the, to the negative world. But what we might see and expect to see is the emergence of some new ministry strategies for the negative world. But by and large, we have not seen that. The one articulation of an approach to doing church in the negative world has been Rod Dreher's Benedict Option. Now, Rod Dreher is not an evangelical. He's Eastern Orthodox, and he was formerly Catholic. And I think the sort of Catholic slash Orthodox sensibility of his book probably did turn off some evangelicals. You know, naming someone after the founder of Western monasticism, it's just not going to sell in a Protestant world with some people. Uh, but I think it actually went beyond that. I think to some extent, one reason that people in the evangelical world did not give Dreer's book a positive review is because they didn't agree with it. They rejected the idea that we had entered this negative world. They were in essence in denial about the reality of where we are, and they wanted to continue more with business as usual. So what we saw as we went into the negative world is essentially a doubling down on many of the strategies that existed before. So the culture war people kind of doubled down on the culture war. And yet though, it was not the same old culture war it ever was. They made some changes. For example, this was a group of people who would have said character in leaders is of paramount importance. That was part of why they were so hostile to Bill Clinton that he, they thought he was just a man of low character and his sexual antics and behaviors and potentially crimes, depending on who you believe, rendered him unfit for office. And yet these people voted for Donald Trump by and large. When it came to Donald Trump, they adopted a more real politique uh, view of character in leaders. They sort of changed their tune uh, in a little bit and became Trumpist in some ways. The cultural engagers too started to morph when the so-called Great Awakening hit America around 2014. Maybe one reason to pick 2014 as the start of the negative world is because of the Great Awakening. There was a lot going on in that period of time. So as these groups went forward into the negative world and started to morph a bit under the pressures of the negative world, this caused those coalitions to crack up a bit. So there were a lot of people that you would have put in the culture war camp who said, I just can't abide Trump. I can't be part of a movement that supports someone like Donald Trump. You could put, say, a David French in this category. David French said, I'm not gonna be a part of any movement that's Trump. So he essentially became a critic of people you would have said were his teammates 
uh, in, you know, not that long ago. Similarly, we might have people who are attending an urban church but are like, wait a minute, my church has gone woke. They're telling me things that I could have learned in a secular university. This isn't the gospel, what's going on? So they become disaffected. And then these seeker-sensitive megachurches, which to some extent represent the broad evangelical middle, they sort of get pulled in different directions, depending on who the pastor is or what location they're located in. Are they more in an upscale kind of corporate milieu, which might lend them more towards the cultural engagement demographic, or are they more maybe a middle class milieu that might lean more towards cultural war demographic. They're getting pulled in different directions and they're experiencing internal divisions as well as different members of their congregation are pulled in different directions. And so in essence, these groups have now to some extent turned on each other uh, and in a lot of ways are as critical of each other as they may once have been uh, the world. And so that is basically the scenario that we find in evangelicalism today. What I have suggested we need to do is take a step back and think about what it means to live in a negative world where we are a moral minority who is not poised to take control of the country or take back the country or anything of that nature. How do we do church in an era where simply being known as a Christian can incur a social penalty if you work in a Fortune 500 company. How do we think about church in that environment? How do we think about some lessons from the Benedict Option? Perhaps we don't have to adopt that wholesale. It comes out of a different religious tradition. But what are some of the resources for our, from our own traditions for thinking about engaging in this world? And that is where I think we need to go because the old strategies just aren't working the way that they used to. Uh, they might be good for kind of the core true believers who are trying to stay uh, faithful to them or firm to them, but it's just not working from the standpoint of relating to the culture. I will say that of these groups, the cultural engagers have the most at risk from this transition to the negative world. If you think about the culture war people, they were sort of never really liked in the elite precincts of society anyway. Someone like Jerry Falwell, he was in Lynchburg, Virginia. He was sort of in a cultural backwater. Uh, again, Pat Robertson, he was in Virginia Beach. So a lot of these people were sort of in cultural backwaters. They mostly you know, dealt with their own media properties, their own newsletters, their own TV shows. They were never liked all that much by the culture. And in fact, they figured out how to monetize being disliked by the culture. If you got a hit job on you in the New York Times, you could fundraise with your 1-800 number off of that. Whereas the cultural engagers, these are people who are at the cultural center. Again, they tend to live in uh, more elite cities. They tend to be engaged in key industries uh, like finance or like government. And they're in the upper middle class milieu and they have a lot of friends in that. And many of them, for example, had you know, friendly journalists writing stories about them in the Atlantic or the Washington Post or the New York Times, something that you know, the culture war people never really had. So the prospect of losing that and being viewed just like the old religious right is not very appetizing. So in a sense, although the transition from the positive world to the neutral world represented a diminution in the status of Christianity in society. It was no longer seen positively. It was seen as a sort of neutral attribute. When you compare the culture war strategy with the cultural engagement strategy, cultural engagement represented an increase in social status. If you think about the strategies of culture war and cultural engagement, then what we see is the switch from culture war to cultural engagement actually represents an increase in social status. And so when you have the social status that you've accrued, not necessarily because you are status seeking, but simply by virtue of the organic way that you lived your life and the way that you tried to reach people in those domains of society, you are at risk if you're no longer bankable in those circles. So this is a model that I think will particularly come under pressure. Yes, the culture war people are gonna continue to be less relevant over time 
But their model is sort of built on being disliked by the culture. Uh, and the people who are sort of leading figures in that, they can, again, fundraise off of it. Uh, they can draw an audience off of controversy, much as Trump did uh, for himself. But I don't think it's going to be necessarily effective in society anymore. So again, we need to look back and say, how do we think about the negative world? How should we live now? And I don't go into a lot of that in the article, uh, but this is the project that needs to be taken on in the evangelical church and something I am going to be working on uh, over the coming months and years.